Welcome. This video is going to take a closer look at electron affinities and electronegativities and its effect on particularly the bonds that form, the covalent bonds. So, so far we've been treating covalent bonds as if they're just single, double, or triple covalent bonds, but they're all the same kind of covalent bond. So we've been kind of assuming that electrons get shared equally. Well, that's not quite true. So let's start out by talking about electron affinity. Electron affinity is very similar to electronegativity. Affinity, if you have an affinity for something, it's in a likeness or attraction. So electron affinity is just the tendency of an atom to an accept an electron. And then electronegativity is the attraction for that shared pair of electrons once it's accepted. So if, if an atom has a high electron affinity, it's likely to accept an electron. And then once it accepts it, the electronegativity is what holds that pair of electrons together. So virtually the same thing, just kind of a technical difference between attracting the electron and then holding on to the pair of electrons. So just like electron, uh, electronegativity, electron affinity is going to be greater for smaller atoms. Okay, Smaller atoms are going to be more likely to attract an electron and accept electrons. So affinity will increase as you go across the period because the charge on the nucleus increases. Now the exception here is that the noble gases don't have a strong affinity to accept, accept an electron because it doesn't need it. Even though it has a high electronegativity and holds on to it, they don't have a need to accept or gain an electron. So if affinity increases across a period as your nucleus gets stronger. And it decreases down a family because the nucleus is getting pushed further out, or the electrons are getting pushed further out with another energy level being added. So the element with the greatest affinity is in the upper right corner, just short of the noble gases, and that would be fluorine. And if you had to guess, the electron with the least affinity, yes, it's in the lower left corner, the largest um, atom, francium. So again, electronegativity is an atom's ability to attract the electrons once it's in a bond. And Linus Pauling actually came up with what he called a value, an electronegativity value. And he assigned every element other than the noble gases a value from 0 to 3.8, with 3.8 being the strongest, which is fluorine. So it's greater for the smaller atoms, so fluorine, and then as you move kind of down and left from there, oxygen and chlorine also have very high electronegativities. Nitrogen, sulfur, bromine, still pretty strong. So electronegativity is still going to be greatest for the smaller atoms, so it will increase across a period as that nucleus gets stronger and pulls things in tighter, but it will decrease down a family as you add an energy level and move those electrons further out. So the difference in electronegativities is what determines the type of bond formed, whether it's ionic, and there's actually been a transfer of electrons, or whether we call it a polar covalent or nonpolar covalent. And so we're really going to focus here on what is a polar covalent and a nonpolar or pure covalent bond. Well, to determine your bond type, it's really just some simple mathematics. You look up the electronegativity for each atom. Remember, it's somewhere between 0 and 3.8. You can use a table. You can just Google electronegativity values, and you get a table. Or you can use your helping hand or page 265 in your Glencoe book. But when you have the two values, you subtract them. Just take the larger minus the smaller, because it's going to be an absolute value we deal with. And if the difference is zero, then you have what's called a nonpolar or pure covalent bond. The electrons are shared equally. Each atom has an equal attraction for that pair, so they spend 50% of their time by each atom. If it's greater than 1.7, that means one electron or one atom has a much stronger attraction for those electrons, and the electrons are actually transferred to that stronger atom, and you form two ions, a positive and a negative. But if it's between 0 and 1.7, then we call it a polar covalent bond. And that's when the electrons are still being shared, but they're not being shared equally. They're spending more time around the stronger one. And the closer that number gets to 1.7, the more unequal the sharing is. If it's closer to 0, then we say it's just slightly polar versus highly polar. So what if the bonds are polar? Well, polarity is the property of having poles or being polar. 
So it's having a positive and a negative end. So molecules often have these polar bonds. Okay, in fact, most polar bonds are going to be polar because the only pure covalent bond is going to be between two atoms of the same element. Otherwise, if you look at your chart, they all have different electronegativity, so there'll at least be some slight polarity to the bonds. So you've got one atom holding on to electrons more often. So what? Well, that's going to affect the molecule. Okay, the polar molecule is going to be caused if the shape of the molecule allows for the electrons to hang out more on one end of the molecule than the other end. So now your molecule also has a positive and a negative end to it. But it's also possible, depending upon the shape of your molecule, that the polar bonds are balanced or symmetrical around it, and there is no positive or negative end. So then the polar bonds really don't have any effect on the molecule's behavior. I know this is getting a little complex, but let's just focus on polar bonds right now. So polar bonds, again, are caused by unequal sharing of electrons, which is caused by a difference in electronegativities. It means the electrons hang out more by the stronger or more electronegative atom more of the time. This makes one end of the bond more negative and the other end more positive, which makes the bond polar. And then these two different ends are called dipoles, meaning two poles, a positive pole and a negative pole. So determining the bond type, to determine the type of bond each of the following compounds would have, you just need to have an electronegativity chart nearby. And you don't have to draw these structures because we're just talking about the bond. So NaCl just has one bond. If I look up Na's electronegativity, it's 0.93. Chlorine's electronegativity is 3.16. I subtract these, 7, 6 minus 3, it's not, it's not 7, it's 3. Going backwards there. 6 minus 3 is 3. 11 minus 9 is 2, but I still have a 2 left. So 2.23, that's much higher than 1.7. So that's considered an ionic bond. H2O... Remember, it looks something like this, um, but it really doesn't matter. Oxygen is going to be my center atom. The two hydrogens are going to be bonded. So I don't have to calculate more than once. In either case, the hydrogen has electronegativity of 2.20. Oxygen is 3.44. So this is an electronegativity of 1.24, a difference of 1.24. So that's greater than zero but it's less than the 1.7. So this is going to be polar. In fact, it's highly polar. That's getting up close to that 1.7. The O2, oxygen is 3.44, but when you take anything minus itself, you get zero. So you really don't even have to look this one up. This one is going to be nonpolar or what's considered pure covalent, truly equal sharing. So as we take a look at the next page here, it says determine the type of bond each of the following compounds would have. And you can see I've looked at my electronegativity values, and I'd encourage you to try that yourself. See if you agree. I think I've got them all correctly. Nitrogen's the only one I had a little trouble seeing. I think that's 3.04. And so when you subtract them, what would each of these be? Well, 2.13 makes MgO ionic. BEF2, which remember can form an incomplete octet, this case is actually going to form an ionic bond because it's greater than 1.7. And NH3 is going to form a polar bond. So to sum up, bonds are polar when electrons are not shared equally. And electrons are shared unequally if there's differences in their electronegativities. Differences greater than zero, but less than 1.7. That means the end of the bond where the electrons hang out, or the area of the atom where the electrons hang out, is going to be more negatively charged. So the end where the electrons hang out more is going to be negatively charged, and the electrons where the, uh, or the area where the electrons hang out less is going to be positively charged. And this is known as a dipole, a positive end and a negative end to the bond.